Dear EA Dice, Hi, it's me, Austin. I'm writing to you today because I just picked up Mirror's Edge Catalyst. You know, the sequel you waited eight fucking years to make. Do you know what I was doing in 2008? Masturbating and playing World of Warcraft and just this. What? what? Is this? Just look at me. What the fuck was I even? Get that fucking thing off your chin, you weirdo. Where was I? Oh, right. Mirror's Edge Catalyst, the rooftop running simulator that puts you in the minimalist shoes of Faith Connors, a superhuman parkour expert who operates in the background of respectable society as a runner. She's basically Han Solo if he were an Asian woman who ran across rooftops and did flips and rolls instead of not shooting Greedo first. Faith Connors runs, jumps, wall runs, tucks, rolls, and kicks her way through the game like it's effortless. As someone who's largely sedentary in my life and gets winded anymore by cycling five miles, the more I played Mirror's Edge Catalyst and the more I heard Faith's feet slam over and over on the floor as she ran and only very rarely sounded winded, I found myself more and more aware of how much fucking exercise she's doing. For extended periods of time, too. So I couldn't help but wonder, is Mirror's Edge completely fucking ridiculous? Is it even possible for someone to run, jump, and perform extended periods of exertion to the level that Faith does without killing yourself or breaking a leg? This question, while seemingly simple at face value, has consumed me for the past week. I've lost sleep analyzing gameplay footage, charting graphs, and reading sports medical journals, and the truth Behind the reflection of Mirror's Edge is deep, complex, and surprisingly cool. The first step is to look at parkour. Parkour is similar to a sport called free running. Similar enough, in fact, that some people use them interchangeably, but they're fundamentally different and have vastly divergent core philosophies. Free running is built around getting from point A to point B as creatively as possible. People doing backflips, twirls, and little dances, that's free running. Parkour, by contrast, is about efficiency of motion, and therefore, all the techniques utilized in it are about conserving momentum, energy, and by extension, maximum maximizing safety. Surprisingly, the wall runs in Mirror's Edge are not only possible, they're not all that challenging if you're practiced enough. Well-trained parkour runners can climb walls up to 15 feet high. It seems like they're defying the laws of gravity and motion, but in actuality, it's quite the opposite. When you run up to a wall and hit it, you're stopping because the wall is exerting enough force back into you to reduce your speed rapidly. This same principle is exploited in a successful vertical and similarly horizontal wall run. If you can successfully match your speed approaching the wall so that your foot is exerting force on the wall that is equivalent to the force the wall's pushing back, both backward and forward momentum are canceled out, allowing you to push yourself up for a limited amount of time. But what about those falls? Sure, fine, all the parkour moves and traversal methods Faith does are completely and totally feasible, but falling is one of the most dangerous things a human can do, and incidentally is one of the places our game is most likely to fall short. The Earth is pretty intense and really, really doesn't like it when we leave, so it pulls us back down whenever we're in the air at a feisty 9.8 meters per second squared. That means for every second of free fall, you're speeding up by 9.8 meters per second, which is pretty damn fast. For instance, if you fall from just 10 feet up, you're hitting the ground at a painful 17 miles per hour. What, that doesn't sound that bad? Well, that's like running nearly full speed into a wall. And if you fall from 20 feet up in the air, you're hitting the ground at 24 miles per hour, which is more like an Olympic sprinter running at top speed into a brick wall. So yeah, it can mess you up. A fall from a height like that is unlikely to kill you, but it certainly can, and it's highly, highly likely to seriously injure you. That is, of course, if you don't know what you're doing. You see, Mirror's Edge, like many other games, has instituted a falling role to reduce the force of impact, which is bullshit, right? It's a Hollywood flair to make falling look fucking cool. It doesn't actually help you, does it? Well, that's where you're wrong. In order to understand this, we're gonna have to talk about the difference between impact and impulse. Impulse is the amount of force you'll experience from a fall in total, regardless of how slowly you decelerate, whereas impact is an individual measurement of peak levels of force at any given moment. A, a simplified way of looking at impulse is the force of the impact multiplied by time. So for example, if you jump from 10 feet up in the air, you're always going to experience the same amount of impulse. However, 
impact is a variable of impulse. Impulse is effectively the force of the impact times time. So if you can increase the amount of time it takes you to change speed, you can decrease the impact while maintaining the same impulse and avoiding harm. And this is where the falling roll comes in handy. Deceleration time is measured from the instant your feet touch the ground to the moment where your center of mass stops moving downward. Rolling extends the deceleration time by allowing your torso to keep moving downward and letting you dissipate the impact more evenly throughout your body. In most cases, this adds only a fraction of a second to the fall time, but this can exponentially decrease the amount of impact you're experiencing, reducing the number of g-forces you experience by up to 75%. Because of this, elite parkour and other freefallers can actually fall from heights of up to 20 feet without injury by utilizing proper technique. So yeah, so far so good, but whatever, that's the easy part. TLDR, parkour is possible, big deal. Who the fuck cares? Matt Pat already proved as much in his episode of Game Lab. Well, strap yourselves in, aspiring, near futuristic, dystopian rebel runners, because I'm just getting started. Ultimately, what I'm more interested in isn't Faith Connor's techniques, other than to prove that they're possible. Rather, I'm interested in her seemingly superhuman endurance. This is a person who seems to be capable of endlessly running, jumping, and climbing without stopping, which runs counterintuitively to everything most of us know about working out. You run for a while, and your breathing gets labored, your muscles start to ache, your feet hurt, and eventually you have to stop. What's really going on here? Animals adapted to use oxygen in the atmosphere to, well, cheat. Breathing is second nature to us, so we don't really think about it that much. We know it's not something you want to stop, but it's just as much a provider of energy to our bodies as eating. Actually, quite a bit more so, which is why we breathe so much. Utilizing oxygen in the atmosphere, which is a byproduct created by plants during photosynthesis, allows us to engage in much more energy-consuming behaviors than we would be able to otherwise. Running, blinking, having sex, and even thinking are all things that we owe to the presence of oxygen in our atmosphere. Atmosphere. Our muscles turn carbs into energy by producing something called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. ATP is created by our body in three steps, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Glycolysis creates the stuff the Krebs cycle needs to create the stuff for the electron transport chain, which ultimately creates ATP, the stuff our muscles and other cells use for energy. Both glycolysis and Krebs create ATP as well, but they're more byproducts than the main event, and the electron transport chain produces by far the most. ATP is the fuel your body needs to run, and without enough of it, you're grounded. The problem is that while the electron transport chain creates most of the ATP you'll ever need, it's a relatively slow process, and you can easily burn through your stores of ATP faster than the electron transport chain can replenish them. Luckily, your body is fucking incredible, and it can actually utilize glycolysis as a sort of backup generator for ATP. Unfortunately, glycolysis is part of the respiratory cycle and requires oxygen to run, which is why your breathing picks up when you exercise for an extended period of time. Of course, there's a limit to how efficiently you can pull oxygen from your bloodstream for glycolysis, and oxygen does serve other roles in the body, so eventually you'll hit a place where you can no longer use oxygen to give glycolysis a boost. So that's when your muscles stop, right? Fucking wrong. The human body is so fucking amazing that it has a second backup contingency, you know, for those emergencies when you're running away from tigers and shit. If your body finds itself running low on necessary oxygen and yet still needs to exert itself, it can start anaerobic glycolysis. The uh, anaerobic is just science speak for without air, in this case, oxygen. Glycolysis usually produces pyruvate as a part of its main function, and it continues to produce this while in overdrive to make ATP. This is the chemical that is dependent on oxygen. In the absence of oxygen, Oxygen, however, it doesn't produce pyruvate. It produces lactate, or lactic acid, which releases into the bloodstream. Now, actually, glycolysis is constantly producing both pyruvate and lactate all the time, and the body is pretty good at mitigating lactate levels in the blood supply and keeping them at appropriate levels. As anaerobic respiration increases, however, lactic acid can accumulate faster than the body can clear it out, and under extreme circumstances, levels can spike dramatically. Now, there's a pretty heated debate in the medical field about whether or not lactic acid itself is responsible for muscle fatigue directly, but 
but regardless, lactate levels in the bloodstream are directly correlated to muscle fatigue, with higher levels being associated with burning sensations, involuntary muscle seizing, vomiting, and eventually inability to move. The world's best athletes train their bodies to clear lactate faster and pump blood more quickly and in greater volumes, and it's something that anybody who starts exercising regularly can attest to. The more you work your body out, the less tired you get. This is because your heart muscles actually get stronger and pump more blood, which in turn lets your body clear lactic acid more readily. Also, you can condition your body to simply tolerate higher levels of lactate in the bloodstream. So what does this mean for Faith, our extraordinary parkour athlete? Well, first I had to build an athletic profile for her. My method was complicated, but I'll go over it really fast. The Mirror's Edge wiki states that Faith Connors is 5 foot 9 inches and 125 pounds, but this is taken from the data in Mirror's Edge 1 and Catalyst is a reboot of the series, so I need to run my calculations on my own. So I ran some calculations using pixel measurements, cutscene angles, and a mannequin, which I estimated being 73 inches, the average male mannequin height, and I came within one centimeter of 5'9", so I took her measurements as accurate, using her 125 pounds for 56.699 kilograms. Since she's incredibly athletic, I estimated her at having 10% body fat. Using this, I calculated basal metabolic rate at 1,472 kcal a day, 61.33 an hour, and 1.022 a minute, which I then applied to a caloric method of hydration replenishment to determine that her basal water loss was 0.86 milliliters of water per kcal. <gasps> After acquiring this information and reading several academic and medical journals, I determined her maximal stroke volume, the amount of blood in millimeters of blood pumps at maximum capacity per pump, her maximum heart rate in beats per minute, and her maximal arterial venous oxygen difference, or the efficiency her cells can grab oxygen when under maximum load. All of these combined gives you a VO2 max number, also known as the maximal oxygen consumption, which is a number that tells you how awesome someone's body is at utilizing oxygen. Base VO2 number is 75.389, or the level of a highly trained female athlete, but not world record holding. Lactate threshold, or lactic inflection point, is the point at which lactate levels start increasing exponentially in a bloodstream. Elite athletes have a lactic threshold of 80 to 85%, so I gave Faith a threshold of 80%, or a VO2 of 60. I then built a lactic buildup and depletion model using exponential expressions to show how lactic levels increase exponentially as face reaches maximum VO2, making peak levels impossible to maintain for too long. <gasps> I then dumped all this data into six different escalating exertion buckets using multipliers for calories and hydration, depletion, heart rate, blood volume, and arterial venous oxygen difference to determine the individual VO2 and therefore lactic buildup or depletion all by minute. I then went through the entire main quest of Mirror's Edge, doing minimal side quests that would help me along the way, and then went through all the footage minute by arduous minute to determine her levels of exertion for the entire main story, plugged in numbers in, crafted out, masturbated, and now we're here. So, the entire main story with a few side quests took me approximately seven hours. That's impossible, right? Seven continuous hours of extreme demanding exercise? Well, yes, but it turns out things aren't that simple. The course of the main game takes place over four separate days, broken up by exposition dumps and followed by Faith actually saying, hey, uh, fuck y'all, I'm going to bed. She does this three separate times. This is actually huge because this spreads these seven hours of exercise into four major chunks that we can look at separately and gives her time to recover, eat, and drink. And somewhat depressingly rendered my measurements of calories and water loss mostly irrelevant. Oh well. Anyway, none of the graphs are all that interesting other than to show that Faith undergoes peaks and troughs of activity. The most interesting graphs, though, are easily the ones that show lactic acid. For one, they illustrate how short bursts of near-peak exertion can take a long time to disperse, and they also paint a relatively interesting picture for the entire game. In the first chunk of the game, lactic acid levels stay relatively low, peaking near the end, and then dissipating as exertion ramps down. Day four, however, they start high, stay high, and reach incredible concentrations. But more on that in a bit. Seven hours over four days radically changes our story. Instead of being an impossibly long marathon of self-destruction, it's four surprisingly manageable, albeit intense workouts. Day one is one hour and 12 minutes. Day two is two hours and 13 minutes. Day three is another two hours and 13 minutes. And the intense day four is a breezy hour and 20 minutes. Now, the amount of lactate that's in your blood, even at peaks, is almost nothing you'd notice if I placed it in front of you. The amounts are measured in millimoles per liter, and the most highly trained athlete in the world will never have more than a few drops of lactate in their bloodstream at a time. That being said, it doesn't take that much to render you completely and totally incapacitated. Most people can't handle much more than 15 millimoles per liter of lactate without doubling over. Olympic sprinters are known for abusing their glycolysis process, and they register as high as 25 millimoles per liter of lactate after a race, but they typically don't run for more than 10 or so seconds. Why am I telling you this? Well, because for 15 
15 solid minutes during the last section of the game, Faith's estimated blood lactate levels were at or near 20 millimoles, a patently unsustainable level of exertion. It's fucking impossible. After about a minute of this level of lactic acid in your bloodstream, your body would just stop working, forcing you to the ground until you've had enough time to recover and clear out the excess lactate. Not exactly something you would want to happen in the middle of a fight for your life. So. What? This is it, right? Even under generous circumstances, faith is complete bullshit? Well, yes and no. Yes, the level of endurance she displayed in my game is a bit absurd, but well-trained athletes are able to clear lactic acid levels more quickly than the average person, and more importantly, can recover from muscle fatigue with rest more quickly. Faith in my game hit unsustainable levels of muscle fatigue because she ran non-stop into the final mission with a hefty 12 millimoles of lactic acid per liter of blood. At her fitness level though, if she had just taken 10 minutes to sit and eat a Snickers and drink a Gatorade, she would have never hit the wall at all. So. There you have it. Sure, Faith is a fucking badass, and if you play the game nonstop for several hours, she's gonna display the endurance of fucking Superman. But in most realistic circumstances, she's actually well within the realm of realistic human fitness, which means that most of you, if you wanted, could spend every day training your body to be just as awesome as hers. Just, you know, remember to rest every once in a while, or you'll find yourself having a really, really bad time. Sincerely, Austin. P.S. That being said, there's a couple of ridiculous zipline and falling physics and at least one absurd stunt that's near the end of the game that I won't get into now, but you're not off the hook just yet, EA Dice. Someday, someday soon, I'm gonna take a closer look at that windmill. Oh, and uh, also, today's Monday, right? Head on over to our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash shoddycast. At 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, I'm gonna be restarting my game of Mirror's Edge Catalyst and streaming it. See you there. I'm actually probably there now. Thank you for watching my episode on Mirror's Edge. I spent an incredible amount of time on this. Um, I'm doing a little bit of experiment right now where I'm spending all my time focusing on the science episodes because I find myself having questions that I can't answer, uh, with, have enough time to answer while working on another video. So if you liked this video and you want to see more of it, share it with your friends and family and whatever, because the more successful this is, the more likely I am to devote all my time to answering game science questions, but they're very time consuming. Also, if you're going to do parkour, it's very good for you, um, but you have to start safely and go to a gym and find a group. Don't just start, start go jumping after over buildings because like, Austin said I could do it, man. Yeah, woo! Don't do that. I want to put, throw out a personal thank you to our Patreon supporters who make this show possible. If you appreciate the amount of work that we put into the videos that we make, then you should head over to our Patreon page and contribute if you want to. It makes it easier for us to make content and we can get more people in here. Man, isn't it fun? Andrew made a thing about Brotherhood of Steel and shit. Anyway, I'm gonna go drink some water. Speaking of dehydration, whew. Bye.